Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Kind of a normal looking tooth today, but wait until you see what we got on the inside. So as you can see, a little bit of recurrent decay on number three there and very visible. You can see that ugly, ugly looking composite. Just exactly what you want to see. Now, when we look at the scan, I did want to do a specific thing showing through the scan that this tooth looks pretty normal. Definitely has an MB2. Otherwise, doesn't look anything out of the ordinary as we're going through it you can see that the sinus is involved quite heavily here and the side if you haven't uh, done this before this is a great idea for your local ent providers talk about how if there's a difference in the sinuses that's usually from a tooth if it's a unilateral it's a great way to get some cross collaboration involved with other medical professionals and i will get referrals every now and then from ents for this exact thing which is kind of a cool different referral stream if you haven't done this before so this tooth is going you need a crown so the first thing we're going to do is flatten it out like normal and something i've noticed i haven't talked about this before i have noticed sometimes when i'm starting to flatten the teeth you'll actually drop into the decay um stuff that you may miss normally because it kind of is underneath the cusp tip things like that so you can kind of see the decay already starting to show through here now anytime the sinus is involved I always warn patients that there may be the need for calcium hydroxide i, I find it's about a 50 50 coin flip whether or not i'm able to get the case dry so my access is going to be far more conservative. I'm not going to take out some of the decay. I'm not going to take out all of the restorative material because at this point, I don't know if I'm going to finish it. Spoiler alert, we do finish the case. <laughs> and thanks to you, that's over now. And you've ruined that for me. So this is why the axis is just kind of more traditional. I did take out, uh, I, I use the composite kind of as the existing axis. I know we've talked about this in my axis video before. And you can see on the inside, clearly dead, lots of staining from the decay inside there, but nothing out of the order at this point. So we're going to start like we always do, take an 8C, that, that powell is wide open, drop down, the distal buckle pretty much dropped to length 2, as did MB, and this is me kind of trying to feel for MB1, didn't really get much here, so what I'm going to do now is open up the three canals that are wide open, as you can see they dropped to length, uh, working length here I believe was 21, so uh, going to the stopper gives me a millimeter and a half of extra, and you can see I'm kind of playing around and I actually pick up a second distal buckle right there. So there's already an extra canal along here. Um, you can see MB1 drops down very nicely. A lot of schmutz inside there and nastiness. And if you aren't able to, sometimes the rotary is able to grab these canals better. And so you can see I'm able to get a little bit in there as far as the MB2. I'm not using a ton of pressure. I know some of you have asked me about the technique for this. It's really light pressure. You want to have the file itself do the work and find it for you. So I'm giving very, I mean, we're talking maybe half a pound of pressure, very light, almost letting the weight of the handpiece itself do the work here. We're going to use Triton. It seems to work really well in these cases to get all that nastiness out. I know there's some questions about bacteria, and yes, I will get to one eventually on that. <laughs> I have a lot of uh, the, the resident. I, I, I love all of you, but the residents do come first. So they, they're the ones who get to decide the, uh, <laughs> the lecture topic. So we're doing anesthesia this week. <laughs> anyway, uh, I wasn't able to really get that far down the MB, so I am going to be troughing here. And we've talked about this before as far as troughing techniques. You want to go from the MB1 to the palatal making a comma. So draw a straight line between the two of them and then make a gentle curve around the outside. And generally you're going to find your MB2 somewhere along that curve, usually within about one to three millimeters of that line. Now that we're inside there, you can see that staining and that, you know, it definitely is dark from all the decay in there. That's where the 2006 is able to pick up a little bit, but I also found this little spot right here, as you can see, and it almost has like a line running the entire length. And so I wanted to show the combing at the beginning because this isn't a fused root, but it almost behaves like one. And in cases like this, I like to take the 17 and peck along as it's running. You can see how there's stuff kind of along that entire length here. And the 17, all of these are really nice. Once again, rotaries pull up debris. And you can see this drop down very readily with no issues whatsoever. Uh, same length as that MB1. So there's your MB2. And I was still pecking along. And as you can see, there's an MB3. So that's why I chose this video if the title didn't give it away. 
there are six canals inside this tooth, <laughs> which is pretty darn crazy to have this many. Um, it, it is more common than you think. Once again, in my MB2 study, I found far more cases that had MB3s than had just a single MB. So do keep this in mind. You do want to be troughing along here. This is a really nice technique for finding them of taking a spinning rotary file and just gently pecking, almost like if you were taught to use an endo explorer to find canals, A, don't. It's terrible. It's not a good way to do it. <laughs> um, but but B, use something spinning instead because you're not going to compact debris down inside there. It's going to pull it up and oftentimes it'll drop down really nicely. So this is another one where multiple canals, we didn't really use the hand files at all. It was more of a, you know, scouting instrument than anything for me. And as you can see, we're looking pretty darn good there. The rubber dam was a little unhappy here. <laughs> so dude, it, it worked. It was, it was sealed, but we did have that uh, hole inside there. I think it was from the pretty sure it's in the flat disc. It's not It's not in the visible field, but yeah, there was a small hole at the back, but it's fine. This isn't for Instagram. So what we're doing now is working length, and I found last time I was droning on when we were talking about working length, so I sped it up to three times. If you want to see another working length, how to do it, I have a hundred videos showing how to do working length in every single one. So you, you all know how to do this. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. You can see you're testing all these, making sure the links all look good. And they're all right around that 21 millimeter mark there. MB3 did have a little bit of trouble getting in that. And it's because it takes a pretty sharp curve going into the MB2. Thankfully, by taking the 17 down, and this isn't sped up, by the way. This is back to real time. Um, I was able to get it to go around the curve. You'll see that it kind of hits there and then almost almost it'll start to drop and i find this a lot a lot of people are taught that hand filing is the only way to go i have found that rotaries in my hands are far more predictable you saw that the 10k file hit a straight up wall i could have spent 20 minutes trying to hand file it up and get patent or i could spend 10 seconds with a 1704 and get a same result because what you're going to do after you get that hand file to the apex is you're going to get a rotary file to the apex so why waste your time in case you haven't noticed, I've had a lot of conversations in the last uh, few few weeks about uh, hand filing and rotaries, if you haven't seen my last two videos, the last few videos. So as far as the rest of it, activate it, everything looks good. This one did not drain, which was surprising. I, oftentimes with those really infilled up sinuses, you'll get more drainage. This one, though, looked pretty rock solid, so we were able to finish it all up with no problems. You can see nice bubbles with the Triton, it makes me feel good. <laughs> that's that's pretty much what the bubbles do. Because they make all of us feel good. And it looks nice and clean at the end. So we're going to go ahead and obturate this one. Now for the obturation, I probably should have sped that up too because it just took forever. This is a uncut video. The, the total length was probably about... 18 ish minutes, maybe a little less than that. I can look at the. I'll put it at the end. There you go. But in all cases like this, you want to make sure that everything is nice and dry. So even at this point, I am not sure if we're going to finish everything. And that's why I'm doing a lot more work here than normal with the micro suction. Oftentimes you'll find that even when you get down to the very end, you can use a paper point, you'll start to get some drainage. If it's not able to get all the way dry, I'm not going to obturate the case. So that is kind of just a test for me. If I can't get it dry, I'm not going to obturate it. So when we look at the paper points, what I'm pretty much looking at is what does the apical portion of it look like? Am I able to get it dry? You can see me testing it by taking the tip and putting it against the rubber dam on the patient's cheek. And you can see the palatal right there had a little bit more drainage than normal, but we're able to slowly get down and get it dry and so this is a good test to see you have a dry paper point if it is wet it will bend because it loses its structural integrity so this is a nice test to see if you're able to get the case dry and once again this is a strong hard rule for me if i cannot get the case dry i will not complete it and we'll use something like calcium hydroxide in the interim now some of you may be asking you have a fancy gentle wave why don't you do use it here on carious cases i tend to not like it as much it tends to leak a little bit more i know there are ways around it but in this case i had already done most of the work and yeah i'm just at this point, <laughs> not gonna. If we weren't able to get it dry, we'd stop here. Now you'll notice that that palatal has gone from being almost a like nasty clear fluid, which is usually the sinus, to red. That's a sign. Uh, it's actually good. That means that we're nice and dry, and so I'm happy with that. There's the still photos looking solid. And you want to make sure you show all those. If you're, you got a six canal tooth, you want to make sure you get photographic evidence of it. <laughs> and then we're, here we're going to be using the squirt technique. Now. 
I think I've talked about this before, but the one of the limitations of the squirt technique is in type two canal systems. In this one, the MB3 joins up nice and high, but I do sometimes struggle when the joining point of the two canals is farther apical. Think about it like this. If the tip of the beta is able to get apical to where they join, the squirt technique is going to work great. Um, if, however, it is higher than it, what will often happen is instead of the gutta percha continuing to flow down the main canal where everything comes together, it'll actually back up through the other canal and you'll get a short fill. So I do enjoy using the squirt technique because it's very effective. It's the only way besides thermofill to get, you know, heated gutta percha to the apex. So that's one thing. And this is just one of its limitations. So one of the times I will be using cones is on really deep type two canal systems where they join because I'll end up with a short fill. Sometimes the Pac Mac can be used to make a difference. Sometimes it doesn't, it, it kind of just depends. So um, I'll usually try the squirt technique first. And if I'm still unable to get a good looking x-ray, if the Pac Mac doesn't work, I'll go back and remove it. It doesn't take long to quickly remove the gutta percha with a heated instrument and then a, like a 2006, and then I'll fill it with a 2006 cone and call it a day. So kind of just wanted to put that in there. Uh, that being said, I know some of you out there have started to try this technique. Drop a comment below. Let me know how it's going. Do you have any issues with it? Have you struggled? Are you afraid to use it? <laughs> you know, what, what's, uh, what's going on with your situation there? So um, I, I know the few people who have reached out uh, either privately or via comments have uh, had some success with it. So let me know how it's going. And if there's anything else I could help you with, uh, once again, I always said, <laughs> I always said I was never going to teach anyone how to do it. And here I am teaching the entire internet how to do this technique that is very technique sensitive. So that's very fun. Um, <laughs> so let's finish up this up duration here. And you'll notice I'm using the thicker end of the BNL beta or the, uh, the condenser to kind of sear everything off here. When you have multiple canals like this, oftentimes they'll, it's difficult in that final like coronal three millimeters to get everything nice and sealed. And this is where that tool, because it's sharp, because it has 90 degree angles, you can almost cut the gutta percha. And so it creates this really nice flat surface. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I take pictures. One of my mentors always said that the best endodontists take pictures and clearly the best, best ones take videos because there's no lying with a video. <laughs> but I think one of the reasons we say that is because if I weren't taking, if I was just relying on x-rays, like historically we would have done, I would have left it completely flat and called it a day. You know, there's no need to make it look pretty because that's all I'm doing is making it look pretty for a picture, which given my previous Instagram rants, that might be something I need to look at in therapy, but that's a different story as well. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing here is just making it so that you can see all three canals really clearly because did it really happen if you don't show off and show it at least a little bit? And in my case, I show it to the entire internet. So multiple canal teeth are always fun. Make sure you get some good pictures of it. Take your time with photos. Um, I know I sent a, I did a video a while ago on photos. If anyone would like a refresher on that or kind of an update for where we are, please let me know. I'd be happy to put one of those together. As you can see, I'm spending a little bit more time probably than I would normally if it wasn't a multiple canal tooth <laughs> on the, uh, on cleaning it up and just making sure everything looks perfect here. And so at this point, we're pretty pretty close to done. Now, this is uh, from a referral who he's awesome, um, but he does like to do his own restorative. And so at this point, I know that we're all good to go. So I'm going to finish cleaning up the existing carries composite and just make sure that when the patient arrives at his office, it's a very predictable, easy buildup and easy crown. And I'm still working on the you know restoration video that'll be in probably next year. But one thing to take away, if you are an endodontist watching this, make your general dentist lives easy. That is the best marketing that's way better than crumble cookies. Um, I cannot tell you how many general dentists have asked me, do they teach endodontists to remove all the decay? Why not? The, why is that not the standard of care? And I don't know the answer. It doesn't take that much longer. It's going to take me probably two minutes here to make their life so much easier because we're doing this in a very controlled environment. There's a rubber dam on. I have an assistant right there. I have the microscope. I can see everything. And so because I'm already running way ahead of schedule here, why not spend an extra few minutes making it that the tooth is as predictable as possible? And you want to clean out everything. Now, at this point, you can see that weird little spot where I'm kind of flicking around there. I was trying to figure out what this was, this weird little red spot. Oftentimes, if the restoration gets too close 
to the pulp, which is like what I believe probably happened here initially, or maybe the bacteria did, you'll get some almost hemorrhagic staining, and so it'll be red inside there. So that actually is the palatal pulp horn. So I was trying to figure out what that was and decided just to take out the rest of the, you know, kind of nasty looking dentin, which does bring me to another point. I know there are some great dentists out there who talk about bonding to affected dentin, to bonding to stained dentin, and you can totally do that. I, I agree with that. You'll notice I'm leaving this stuff down in the actual chamber. But if you're going to be wanting to have your dentist trust you to remove everything, make sure you give them a nice clean surface at the most coronal margin so that they know that their bond is going to be rock solid. So, uh, you know, anything that looks slightly soft or just discolored, it's a good idea to go in there and clean it out. And what I'm doing here is we're going to call it the latent technique. He doesn't know that I'm going to name it after him, but <laughs> that's the how you use a dried uh, skinny diamond to get the get a perch looking nice and smooth there because we want to make sure it looks good there too, obviously. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good little technique on these cases just to make sure everything looks rock solid. Go back in and I'm trying to get a clear, you know, nice shot of the two distals as well. So once again, I love the back end of this plugger. It's one of the few things that I bring with me no matter where I've worked. I, I cannot really do root canals without it. And then the final thing I'm going to do here is for the patient's sake, we just created a bunch of sharp right edges, right angled edges and it's very nice to just go in quickly smooth this off it doesn't take that much extra time and a trick to do there is to actually use your glove to feel if anything feels sharp if it catches your glove it's going to catch their finger their tongue and so that's what I'm doing there is trying to make sure that everything feels nice and smooth and it looks great so with that we're gonna get to the final pictures here you can see it looking really pretty as far as those six canals um, the chunkiness you can see in the final x-ray there. So even though these are 17s, because there's multiple of them, it does make it look larger. So thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions, please drop and I will talk to you all next time.